Christ is king. Uh, yes, that's what the church indeed. has said for 2,000 years. That's part of the deposit of faith, sacred scripture, sacred tradition. Paul, I'll tell you, the people that have given birth to this whole Zionist movement mm-hmm. has been the rapture theology. Schofield, yes. Darby, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. The whole rapture yes. movement that Christ is going to come back and set up a thousand-year reign, this is what's given... Uh, it, it, it's what's created Christian Zionism or that alliance, yes. which is pushed yes. heavily by the TBN channel, by the way. Because of the viewpoint. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Yes, sacred scripture says, Paul the Apostle himself says that, yes, God has not, you know, failed to keep his promises. He will deal, you know, in his time with uh, with the unbelieving Jews in the future. However, at this particular point in time, uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, um, the so, uh, the promises of Christ belong to the church. They belong to his people. We bear his mark, the indelible seal of baptism. We belong to Christ, and therefore we follow him uh, and we understand that he not only reigns in our hearts, Jess, but he reigns in society. It all belongs to him. Yeah. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and no one else. And that's what this next article says very clearly. Here's It says, here's what the Catholic Church actually teaches about Christ the King. In 1900, Pope Leo XIII said, the world has heard enough of the rights of men. Let it hear of the rights of God. This sentence is key to understanding what is actually meant when Catholics proclaim that Christ is king. The world has, uh, yeah, this is what Leo said. In, uh, this declaration is not just a spiritual platitude about the next world, nor is it about establishing a theocracy or bludgeoning others with our religion. It is something much more expansive. The Feast of Christ the King. Here's a context. In 1925, the world still remembered the First World War. Formerly, Catholic countries were continuing their decline into secularism. The Mexican revolutionary government was consolidating its control and persecuting the church. The Weimar Republic in Germany was allowing all sorts of immorality and decadence. And only a few years before, the Masonic government in Portugal had been persecuting the three children of Fatima. Looking around him, Pope Pius XI saw that the world was in the grip of anti-clericalism, its errors, and impious activities. He taught that the panoply of evils facing us today was due to men having, quote, quote, thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives, both in private affairs and in politics. In response... He instituted the Feast of Christ the King to minister to the need of the present day and at the same time to provide an excellent remedy for the plague which now infects society. This feast, based on the doctrine of his 1925 encyclical, Quas Primas, was established to commemorate our Lord's kingship, not just over the hearts of his faithful, but rather over every man, family, state, nation, and society. I'm holding that encyclical right here. It's not even that. You can download it from the internet. It was written back in 1925. Uh, It's it's not that thick. This this was the Pope's response, Pope Pius XI, his response to World War I and and the impending World War II. This was his response to communism, Nazism, fascism. His response was that the only way all of this can be uh, ameliorated and and healed and repaired was through the entire world embracing Jesus Christ as king. Not just in your hearts, but we're also talking about nations as well, surrendering to Christ the king. And Jess, this is what I tell people, Jess. We have basically, we are alive in a time where it's just the, the remnants left of Christendom, you know, uh, the the great uh, uh, Western world, the Western culture that the Catholic Church 
and I'll say it again, the Catholic Church has built ever since uh, the devil has been waging war, infiltrating the church with uh, uh with him with imposters with wolves in sheep's clothing uh the protestant reformation the french revolution and all these things are designed to erode what christ commanded us to do which is to go out into the world make disciples of men teach them all that he has commanded and baptize them in the name of christ that is our birthright as catholic christians that's right paul and uh christ the king this 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 is found, by the way, it's in the book of Revelation many times, chapter 19 specifically. It goes yeah. th- through the through the, the the power of Jesus Christ. But again, this has been repeated by the Catholic Church, like Pope Leo XIII. He said that the whole world is subject to the power of Christ, the King. The whole world, yes. the political world, the secular world. Who else That's said this? Me. Well... Pope Pius X also said this. Who else said this? Pope Pius XI also said this. Who else said this? Even Pope John Paul II said the exact same thing in a homily, that the whole world is subject to Christ the King. This is, this is how you know something is part of the deposit of faith. Here it is. Number one, it's found in Scripture, Revelation 19. Number two, it's repeated by popes, one pope after another. Now, yes. If something is just said by one Pope and it's not found in scripture, it's not part of the deposit of faith. I'll make it very uh-huh. simple. Okay. It's very simple. This you, is the criteria. What are you, say, what are you saying, Jess? I'm just, I don't know how many piece things together. <laughs> if, if, if a Pope says one thing that no other Pope has ever said, and it's not found in scripture, it's not part of the deposit of faith. It's his opinion. Yeah. But the Christ the King is biblical and it's papal because it's been proclaimed by one Pope after another. Go ahead, Paul, pick it up, finish up. Yeah. Setting the terms by which Christ can be king would make him a mere figurehead. It would place the true sovereignty elsewhere, be that in ourselves or as increasingly the case today, the secular state itself. A mere internal or future eschatological kingship puts Christ and his religion on the same level as false gods and false religions in the public sphere. And that's what we see, just this trending. This is indifferentism. In the encyclical, Pius XI teaches, in in the encyclical, Pius XI teaches that at the last judgment, Christ who has been cast out of public life, despised, neglected, and ignored, will most severely avenge these insults. We can see that these insults are already being avenged in our own time. When the teaching of Christ's kingship over society is abandoned, it should not be surprising that the state encroaches into the power vacuum. And that is exactly what we see in those purporting to be our shepherds. Uh, if those purporting to be our shepherds do not defend the kingship of Christ, as well as the immunity and liberty of the church, which is entailed in this kingship, then we cannot be surprised to find that the state subjects the church to its power, infers, uh, interferes with the exercise of her mission, or even suppresses her altogether. And I will turn around and say, and persecutes her. We cannot call Christ our king if we try to interfere with the extent of her rights over us. This is to turn him into a constitutional monarch or to say with the wicked men in a par- in the parable we will not have this man reign over us Luke chapter 19 verse 14 or to say with the wicked men we will not have this man and that's what it's all about Jess it's about the world the Bible says that the world the flesh and the devil are attempting they are they are our enemies and it's just a flood that you know the world wants to reject Christ just like we just we just heard it in church crucify him crucify him that's what the world wants but guess what in that crucifixion came the redemption of the world on the contrary let us say with love and courage 
we will have this man, we will have this man reign over us. Christ is king. Christus Vincent. <laughs> I love this, Jess. Oh, yeah. Christ reigns. Yes. Amen. Yeah. It says yeah. Christ is victor. Yeah. Christ reigns. Christ commands. That's a battle Christ cry of the, ca- of the ca- of the battle cry of the crusaders. Uh, uh, yes. and, 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 I'll, and I'll tell you, um, it, it, Paul, a lot of Catholics don't even know this. Yeah. A lot of Catholics believe that when they hear the term Christ, the King, they said, they think it's a warm fuzzy. Oh yeah. He's just King of my heart. If, if I believe in him, if I choose to believe in him, yeah. no, it's far beyond that. It's not subjective. This is an objective statement that Christ is king of the universe. He's king of the world and his kingship one day is going to be seen by the entire world at the general judgment at the second coming of Christ. Yes. And that means also, guess what? Most people don't realize Joe Biden is subject to Christ the king. Okay. Yeah. Nancy Pelosi is subject to Christ the king. Okay. Yeah. Those on the other side, Republican Catholics, they're also subject to Christ the King. They have yeah. to watch their pen. They have to watch how they vote. They have to watch what they legislate because everything that they say and do, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be adjudicated or it's going to become, it's going to come out at their tribunal before the yes. tribunal of Christ the King. Everything yes, yes. they say and do. Yes, yes. Um, in my house, I had an enthronement ceremony. When I have the sacred heart of Jesus, this house is enthroned to the sacred heart of Jesus. Um, I have Christ the King on the wall. And it's funny because my son, he had some friends over. Never met him before a day in my life. Young people. And, you know, they grew up like a lot of young people. Uh, one of them barely Catholic. The other one, not sure what the other one was, but I gave them a good dose of Catholic teaching and they absolutely (laughs) absorbed it, Jess. They absorbed it. It's because when you speak the truth, when you speak the truth of God to people, uh, if Christ is lifted up, he will draw men unto him. And that is a simple fact. Do not be shy. And, and, And if you get persecuted, you know you're doing something right. Do not marvel if the world hates you, for the world hated me before it hated you, and a servant is not greater than his master. We can, uh, what the world runs from, persecution and suffering, we can, we, we go to because we know that that perfects love. Amen. At the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord proved that he's the most powerful deadlifter in the world. (laughs) Yep. I love it. That's yes. what Jesus Christ does. He's a dead lifter and the most powerful one that ever walked the face of the earth. Hey, family, that's a wrap. Jesus 911, two man car. See you next time. Happy octave of Easter. God bless you. Keep the faith.